signs and wonders. Somebody asked about miracles earlier tonight. I believe in miracles. I have been healed. But if your faith depends on a miracle, you have a very flimsy faith. The Bible says in Romans 10, 17, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Your faith must be anchored to the word of God, and not to signs and wonders. For the Bible declares that when this power is going at full swing, he doeth great wonders. So that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had, which had the wound by a sword and did live. I'm going to come into that in a moment. The wound that was healed and he did live. And they caused them through deception to form an image to the beast and worship the beast. Verse 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. That the image of the beast should both speak and cause. Look, look. And cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Verse 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And then the last verse says, here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Of a what? And his number is six hundred, three score and six. That's six, six, six. God is being as explicit as he can to those who will hear his truth. He is enlightening us through these mighty prophecies that are yet to come. A nation shall form an image to the Roman power. It will not be Rome necessarily, but an image. When I look in the mirror, I see somebody, but that's not me. That's my image. And it's just like me. And the nation that will do that would be a new nation that emerges at about the same time the deadly wound was inflicted. Don't worry, we're going to explain it. And the nation that did that is none other, could be none other, than our own beloved United States of America. Oh, but you say, wait a minute. The First Amendment, the first of the Bill of Rights guarantees religious freedom. Yes, sir. But right now it's under assault. Politicians want to have a constitutional convention. It's in the paper all the time. They want to force morality upon this nation. And whenever religion is forced by the state, you may know automatically it is a false religion. But when they start forcing it under penalty, then they're acting just like that first beast, Rome, which forced their system of morality and killed 50 millions of people during the Dark Ages. The image to the beast will seek to imitate everything that was done by the previous power. Now we ask, where does this second power get its power? Where on earth did the first beast get his. The Bible says in verse 2, And the beast that I saw was like unto a leopard. His feet were as the feet of a bear. His mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, who? And the dragon gave him. Who is the dragon? And the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. This first persecuting power 
that sought to change God's law and that put to death 50 millions of Christians whom they called heretics, this great power got its power and its seat and authority from the dragon. Revelation 13 and verse 2. It's right there in your Bible. How did this happen? In 321, you can write down the notes and check it in your library. In 321, after the severest persecution under Diocletian, Constantine became Caesar in Rome. He was a pagan. Constantine began to see the balance of power shift from paganism to the church. In 321, Constantine passed the first law enforcing Sunday worship. Until then, there had never been a religious law requiring observance of Sunday. It was done first by Constantine, who was still a pagan. Two years later, in 323 AD, Constantine joined the church. And when the emperor came in, the gates were left open and pagans flooded into the church and brought their festivals and their holidays and their religious ideas. And many of them have been baptized into Christianity. And today we look at them and don't even know that they have no basis at all in scripture. They are pagan. I mentioned a few of them. I talked about Easter. Now we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and that's wonderful. But a chicken and an edge, egg and a rabbit have nothing to do with the resurrection of Christ. They have to do with paganism and the goddess of reproduction in the springtime. And the church brought them together and said, all right, you heathen, you can worship with us. We'll celebrate the resurrection. You celebrate Easter and we'll all join together. And they named it Easter. Christmas, it's all right to commemorate the birth of our Lord. I'm very happy at Christmas time. But what has Santa Claus and trees and yule logs and poinsettias and red candles and balls on the Christmas tree to do with the birth of Christ? Nothing. They are pagan symbols brought in and joined together by the church a mingling of paganism and Christianity. Now Constantine did something very soon after he became emperor and joined the church. Rome had been the capital of the Roman Empire for all of these hundreds of years. Constantine got another idea. In order to control both the eastern and western halves of his empire, he decided to move his capital city. He built the city, Byzantium. He named it Constantinople. Have you ever heard it? Constantinople after himself, Constantine. And he moved the government headquarters over to Constantinople and left Rome vacant. And the papacy moved in and sat on the throne of Caesar. That's why the Bible says the dragon out of paganism gave to this power his seat and great authority. The church took over Rome. And if you think I'm kidding, then you go to the Vatican right now. And you will see 116 embassies in the Vatican. The United States government doesn't send an embassy to a church. They send embassies to nations. And since Ronald Reagan, we have an ambassador in the Vatican. Along with 115 other nations. Are you listening? The dragon gave to the church his power, his seat, and great authority. I was in the Vatican one day looking at the marvels, the art, the, it's magnificent. And I came to a tapestry hanging on the wall. It was 75 feet long. 
And underneath it said, the donation of Constantine to the Pope. The donation of Constantine to the Pope. What did he donate? He donated the city of Rome. And the church became a kingdom. That is the first beast. Revelation 13, 6 said, he would blaspheme God. What is blasphemy? In order to save a minute, let me give you the texts. Check them in your own Bible. Luke 5, 21, when Jesus said he could forgive sins, they accused him of blasphemy, saying, who can forgive sins except God? But today in the Roman church, they allege that every priest can forgive sin. That's why you go to confession. He sits in a little closet. Now, I'm not making fun. I'm simply telling you the truth. And I never belittle sincerity. And some of the finest Christians on earth are Catholics. So the priest sits behind a veil and you sit there and you tell him about your sin. And he might tell you to say so many rosaries or whatever. And then he will utter the Latin words, A to absolvo. I the absolve. I the justify. I the clear. No man on earth can forgive sins. Now when Jesus said he could, they misunderstood him. They didn't know he was the son of God. I want to tell you tonight, he can. Would you say amen out there? The other text I want to give you is John 10 and verse 33. There Jesus called himself the Son of God. And they rose up to stone him. They said, you blaspheme calling yourself the Son of God. What they didn't know was, he was. But from these texts, we get a definition of what blasphemy is. Now, the Bible says he would have power over nations. That's found also in this 13th chapter. Let me give you just an illustration or two. This power chose emperors, chose fiefdoms, chose dukes, and gave these offices out as rewards for faithfulness to the church. There was a king of England named King John. He had to be humbled severely before the Pope would give him power to rule over England. Elizabeth I defied the Pope and he sent word to all Catholics in England not to obey the Queen. Then there was Henry of Germany. Henry of Germany. He offended the Pope and he had to go to a place called Canossa and in order to pay penance he had to stand three days in snow barefooted before the Pope would forgive him. It's a matter of history. Read it in the library. There are books in there that will tell you this. Ladies and gentlemen, every specification was met by this first beastly power. Now the Bible says he would receive a deadly wound. A deadly wound. When did that happen? The Pope rose to power and took over Rome as a kingdom in 538 A.D. When did I say? The Bible says he would exercise power for 1260 years. That brings you to 1798 AD. And here is the thing I want you to carry home with you. Precisely on time. Precisely when the Bible said. Precisely in 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte. You ever hear of him? He had a general whose name was Berthier. He sent him down to Rome and took the Pope prisoner in 1798 and put him into exile in France. And in 1799, the Pope died of sickness. The deadly wound was inflicted. For a brief time, there was no head of the Roman church. It's history. General Berthier, the very year the Bible said, took him a prisoner, put him in Valence, France, as an exile, and he died the next year. But immediately the Bible says the deadly wound would be healed. The very next year, 
1798, 1799, 1800. The very next year.